Well, good morning. Uh, children are dismissed to Children's Church. And we'll get started in here in Big Kids Church. Yeah? Cool. All right. If you're like me, you are constantly bombarded with the evils of this world. I open my social media accounts, and so many of those various news feeds are pointing out everything wrong with the world. And if you're also like me, you may find it difficult to avoid the trap, and so you join the chorus. I've been convicted of this on more than one occasion, and make no mistake, it is indeed a trap. Our adversary wants our eyes on him, preoccupied with his agenda, rather than focusing on and pointing people to Jesus. So often we feel justified in our proclamation of evil. It makes us feel good that we're exposing atrocities or things that we think are evil. We long for people to see it because if they would just see it, then they would change their ways and flee from the evil that seeks to ensnare them or currently controls their lives. We argue with people and get upset when they don't see such obvious evil as it's right there in front of them, but they simply will not acknowledge it. So we start to get frustrated and our flesh begins to take over and we start to compromise who we are in Christ to prove our point and win the argument. Sometimes we do this at the sacrifice of relationships simply to be right and we excuse our right like our rightness, right? We want to excuse this and justify it because we're pointing out these evils. But I contend that if we are more concerned with proving our point than proving Jesus, we are missing the point. I'll say that one again because I have to meditate it on, on it often. But if we are more concerned with proving our point than proving Jesus, we are missing the point. But some of you might be sitting there thinking like, no, 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 wait, Ephesians 5 Paul speaks about exposing the unfruitful works of darkness. He says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Paul goes on in Ephesians 5 to say, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Y'all, it is no secret to the believer that evil is all around us. So much so that God, through Paul, gives us this admonishment to make the most of our time because the very days are evil. I'm not saying don't expose things that are against God. But how you do that and how much time you spend on it matters greatly. See, I think also at times we can even find ourselves being jealous or upset when we see people who aren't following God prospering. They have all the things that we want, and they seem to be doing very well. But they're not following God. And so why don't I have all those things? Because I am. And one of the things that I see people driving crazy these days is when they see someone they perceive as evil seem to get away with everything and continue to live a life of luxury. Y'all, when we focus on the evils of this world, it has the ability to bring about fear, anxiety, panic, jealousy, hatred, and so on. It has the ability to cause us to respond in our flesh rather than how Christ would have us respond. So what does it mean to make the most of our time knowing that we're surrounded by wickedness? Walking in the tension of knowing uh, that before coming to know Jesus, ourselves, we were once wicked, and recognizing that in him we still wrestle with sin. And I have heard the definition of evil as anything that is in contradiction to God's character. And we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, never forgetting who God is and our desperate need for him. This will help us in our conversations with others. That as followers of Jesus, we're called to live differently. We are called to a greater purpose. We are children of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We store up for ourselves treasures in heaven rather than being focused on worldly riches or comfort. That our focus is to be on God and we are to demonstrate who he is through word and deed. So it's just the intro. 
because this morning we're going to be looking at the first actual nine verses of Psalm 37. And though we're only going to cover the first nine, I really want to encourage you to sit down and read all 40 when you have some time. It's one of my favorite sections of scripture because it reminds me of what I'm to do in the midst of evil days and where my focus is to be. So let's pray and then we'll read Psalm 37 verses 1 through 9 together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, first and foremost, we thank you for who you are. That this is the day that you have made. May we rejoice and be glad in it. Father, I thank you for this place on this day, in this time, in this moment, where we can come and we can boldly sing praises to you, that we can exalt your name, that we can get into your word. And Father, we want to hear from you this morning. Lord, it's not about me and what I have to say, but may your truth take root in our hearts. Remove these distractions from us. Help us to focus in. Help us to dial in and tune our ears to what you have for us. That we may have come in one way, but that we leave differently, that we leave changed. May your spirit have your work in our, uh, do your work in our lives. Father, may we live in such a way that in the midst of darkness, we shine brightly the love and light of Christ as we are to love you and love others. And may that be evident and so clear that we are your children, that we belong to you, so that all we come in contact with can't help but think that there's something different. So Lord, we ask that you speak this morning. We thank you again for this time. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Psalm 37, starting in verse 1. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends, to le uh, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, and those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. May the Lord add his blessing at the reading and the hearing of his word this morning. This is an incredibly powerful section of scripture. And I did say, hey, when you get some time, go home and read the remaining verses because they're incredible. But I'll tell you this little secret. Those first nine verses continue to repeat themselves throughout the rest of the 40. The whole passage is driving the same point continually. David is giving us an admonishment he wants us to see how to operate, how to respond in the midst of evil days. How we are to live as Christ followers. And David is the living embodiment of everything he shares in this psalm. David was a hunted man, right? He was pursued by Saul and his men. His life was being threatened for no reason other than God's anointing on his life as he was to be king. David knew what it was like to be surrounded by evil and experienced real persecution as he was cast out of society. David knows what it's like to see his enemies prosper while he sat in a cave and was hunted. But we know how the story goes. We know that David became king. We also know that it wasn't all rainbows and butterflies either. But that David was a man after God's own heart. He understood the deeper realities before him. And David wants the reader to know that regardless of the evils around them, that God is in control. He doesn't forsake his people and that we are to live as his children in the midst of wickedness. In verse one, David states, fret not yourselves because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Now, I'm not sure exactly why the translators use the word fret here. 
Because when we hear the word fret, the word anxiety comes to mind, right? Like worry or anxiety. Don't fret about that. This isn't actually what David is saying in this verse. The word that David is using here is kara, which literally means to glow or grow warm or to blaze up in anger. Right again, in our modern vernacular, fret is to worry. What David is saying is, is don't blaze in anger over the wickedness. So it's not simply don't worry about the wicked, but it's actually saying don't anger yourself because of evildoers. The idea here is that we are allowing other people's actions to control our emotional state. That we can get so worked up over the things that we are seeing that it consumes us. I used to work in a juvenile living facility. And I spent my days with over 100 young people who were away from their families, dealing with some pretty heavy things from the crimes they committed to gang life and just outright brokenness. But I had this conversation with them often. I would ask them, why are you letting people control you? I would say it point blank. Why are you letting people control you? And they would often just look at me puzzled. And I would spend some time breaking it down for them. Because so often we allow other people to control us emotionally, which translates to our actions, which affect how we live. You ever heard the phrase, they make me so mad? They wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't be where I'm at now. Right? This is, this is pretty common. Oh, you make me so mad. I'm so frustrated with you because of how you're acting. And I'm allowing that to control how I respond. If you've had kids for more than 10 minutes, this is like, ah, why do my kids have this ability to take my emotional state and just go, ha, ha, ha. And I'm like, why, why do I just feed into it, right? This is common for us as people. And so we have a tendency to allow people's actions to dictate and determine how we respond because it affects us on some level emotionally. And when we look out into the world and we see evil upon evil, it can control us on an emotional level, which affects how we live. We rage against the machine. We make it our mission to point it all out. We consistently seek to prove our point because of the atrocities that we are seeing are enraging us. And in a nutshell, King David is saying, stop it. Stop letting the wicked control you. Stop it. David knows that the days of the wicked are short and that their day of judgment is coming. David knows that the wicked have received their reward here on earth and they will drink the cup of their wickedness as they experience the wrath of God. See, David has an eternal perspective. And this is why David is telling his readers not to be envious of the wicked. Because they may appear to have it all together. They may look like they're prospering, but this is not the reality this is not the truth as it relates to things that matter. David knows that their time is fading like the grass withers. And in this psalm, David shares the contrast between the wicked and the godly. He goes on in verses 3 through 6, and it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. So instead of focusing on all the evil in the world and allowing it to anger us, rather, trust in the Lord, do good, dwell in the land, and befriend faithfulness. I want to use an example from my life to kind of show what I mean here. This is something I experienced before coming to Christ, but I think it demonstrates these first six verses pretty well, and it deals with a heavy and important topic. Now, honestly, I, I really don't want people to misunderstand something, because I do believe that there are certainly evils in the world that are worth exposing, dealing with, and standing against. What I'm seeing in the psalm, though, deals more with our response to those things and how we are representing Christ as we uh, come against them, right? Okay, so just want to make sure that I'm clear here because I want to talk about abortion. This is a blatant evil in our society. There's no question in my mind. 
And we certainly should be fighting for the right to life and seeking to protect those in the womb. Sadly, I would also argue that this atrocity has become political leverage. And so we often reduce our fight to social media posts and we're arguing politically. And we go back and forth. I don't know, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but I see it all the time. We go back and forth concerning these things. But I want to share something that I experienced almost every Saturday the last three years I lived in Boston. And I called it the gauntlet. I worked at a sporting goods store pretty much right next to a Planned Parenthood. And every single Saturday, rain or shine, there were people out front of Planned Parenthood and they stood on two sides and they made a corridor. And people could walk through them. They all had signs with Bible verses and other phrases on them. And I'm not sure if rowdy is the right word, but it certainly wasn't calm. Now, mind you, I'm not following Jesus, and I had to walk through this corridor several times on Saturdays. And I will tell you firsthand how hateful it came across. It didn't hit me as a loving God. As a matter of fact, it hit me as a bunch of people who were incredibly angry. And anyone who walked through that corridor that was going to go into that Planned Parenthood was going to feel and, and see just how angry they were. All the while shouting Bible verses. Not one, you couldn't, unless you like sat on one person's voice, you weren't going to be able to figure out what was being said. Things were just being shouted continuously. But now coming to Christ, I understand their heart. I just question the method. I understand their desire to want to defend the right to life. I understand that greatly. It didn't then, but I do now. However, this method, I still stand, it's probably not the best way to go. And I want to give you a contrast because, again, not following Jesus at the time that this happened. But throughout the week, there was a sweet little lady. She would stand out front of Planned Parenthood praying. And she would engage everyone who was going in. And I spoke with her often. I watched her pray, with, pray for and with people as they walked in or turned away. I don't know how and to what extent the Lord used her to change people's minds, but I certainly pray it was, it was extravagant. But I knew even back then that I saw something different in her that I didn't see on Saturday mornings. Here's the crazy part. She was often there on Saturdays, but she was outside of the corridor. She was involved, but again, there was something different. She wasn't a part of this gauntlet. She was off over here, and when someone would come, she would just simply ask them if she could speak with them. She could share a little bit about the good news of Jesus. And I watched people engage her. I watched her come along people who were crying and broken because they knew that the decision they were about to make had great ramifications. And they had just been berated by 30 or 40 people. They're already beating themselves up. They're already going through a lot of this, broken. And yet this lady just met them right where they were at. And she would pray with them. Y'all, I didn't come to Christ until 2008. And so for, for a long time, even prior to this, I was when I was in Boston, we moved out, uh, moved out to Michigan in 2005. And so this was throughout that last three years. So we're looking at, at a long chunk of time here. And this woman still stands out to me to this day to the fact where I can use this illustration because I feel like it is so powerful in this space. That this is what David is getting at. That we can be so enraged by the evils we see that we create a corridor where there are carefully selected Bible passages yelling at people, telling them how wrong they are. Or we can be like this lady. We can seek to come alongside people in love understanding that without God opening their eyes, they cannot see the very evil in front of them or the very evil that they're participating in. 
that this lady stood in front of Planned Parenthood throughout the week seemed to understand this, that she was genuine. You could tell she cared about the people walking in that building. So the question we have this morning is, which one are you? Are you the one creating the corridor? Got all your Bible verses, yelling at people, telling them how wrong they are? Or are you the individual willing to meet people in their brokenness, willing to meet people in their mess, willing to meet people where they're at and walk with them, loving them, having hard conversations with them because you've developed relationship with them? Because make no mistake, how you handle this matters. Fight for what is right, yes. Fight for what is true, but fight as Christ would have you fight. We have to understand that there's an eternal perspective, and that is that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And this is stated in Ephesians 6. Our battle is not with people. But so often we make it about people. Right? And David's admonition is trust in the Lord and do good. David comes out by saying, don't be angry or envious of the wicked. Then he says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Y'all, this, this is really where the rubber meets the road in this. Because as we delight ourselves in the Lord, our desires begin to change. Right? We no longer what the world, uh, want what the world has to offer. Rather, we want what God wants for our lives. And when we trust him and delight in him, our desire is for him. And as a result, we'll be content with what he has given. So David is saying, don't be envious of the wicked as they've received their reward. Rather, delight yourself in God and watch him provide and take care of you. That our satisfaction is found in him, not the things of this world. This starts to change our heart. Because then he goes on and says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Y'all, when we honor God with our lives, he fights our battles. When we honor God with our lives, he fights our battles. When we have focus on living as God has called us to live, we are going to be living countercultural. People will take notice. I've shared this verse a hundred times in this church, but I'm going to share it again. It's Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Verse is, I guess. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Notice how this verse doesn't say, yell at people, tell them how wrong they are, and scream your Bible verses, and then they're going to give glory to God. It doesn't say that. It says, live in such a way that people are going to see that you clearly belong to God because the things you are doing are different so that they can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That matters. And again, I'm not saying don't stand up for what's right and true. If you know me, you know that's a thing I do. Sometimes to a fault, which is why this message penetrates my heart. Because I can be the one arguing with people because I want desperately for them to see it. And God has continued to convict me. Joe, you will never argue them into the kingdom of God. It's not going to happen. Have the conversations. Share the truth in love. Come alongside them. Walk with them. Do life together. Represent me well. In that space, I've watched God move tremendously. In that space, I've seen lives changed.
when we are living as we have been called to live as followers of Jesus, it is evident in how we handle ourselves. And we trust that God will do his thing. So much so that people will see our lives and glorify our Father in heaven. The bottom line is it's not about us, right? Again, if I'm more concerned with proving my point than Jesus, I'm missing the point. And often, if I'm more concerned about proving the point, who's that about? It's about me. Because I want to win the argument. Because I'm the one who knows the truth. And you're the idiot who doesn't. I mean, it's crass, but that's how we treat it, right? Like, that's how it is. Like, this person, I can't believe they don't see it. How do they not see it? They're so stupid that they can't see it. And I'm sitting here like as if I figured all this out on my own. As if God didn't open my eyes to the realities of who he is. But that's not true. God did open my eyes to the reality of who he is. And I only know the truth because of him. And yet I'm over here telling these people they're idiots because they don't know what's right. I didn't know what was right. I didn't have the slightest clue until God opened my eyes. It's not about us. Because in our flesh, we want to force our hand. We want things to happen immediately. We have a hard time waiting for God to move, and we want his action to be swift and powerful. But as we see in verse 7, that we are to wait patiently, trusting him. But because of our sinful desires, we tend to try to put on our own righteousness. We try to have our own righteousness on display instead of waiting on the Lord and allowing him to bring forth the righteousness. But we want to be judge, jury, and executioner. We're so often slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to become angry, rather than quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So do we trust God in the midst of evil days? Is our heart for people to come to know Jesus, or are you bent on proving your point? David, continuing on, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourselves over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourselves, it only or it tends only to evil. For the evildoer shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. We all know that strength will rise when what? Strength will rise when we wait upon the Lord. You guys know the song, you know the verse? You good? Strength will rise when we wait upon the Lord. Good, you're tracking with me? You still here on Sunday? We good? All right, cool. So our strength rises when what? When we wait upon the Lord, which is what David just told us to, right? He said, wait patiently for the Lord. Don't fret, don't worry, don't be angry about these things, but rather wait patiently for the Lord to do his thing. Wait patiently for him to move. You are to simply trust him and cultivate faithfulness. That you are to do good in the land. That you are to live in such a way that shows and demonstrates the love of Christ. And our strength will rise when we wait upon the Lord, when we are focused on him, trusting him, being still, and knowing that he is God. This speaks volumes to a lost and dying world. Again, David draws us to our focus, which is Christ. So he's saying, be still before the Lord. Don't be angry over those who prosper in their way through evil devices. David literally states, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. You guys know the story, right? David can kill Saul. He can do it. He's got him. He's like, man, this is going to be easy. He doesn't, though. But he does send Saul a little bit of a warning, right? Cuts the hem. And... But Saul realizes he's been spared because David could have quickly killed him. Uh, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. And it also didn't go very well for the, for the person who did end up killing Saul. Different scenario. But this is what I'm saying. Like D David is coming back to the fact that he knows because God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is moving through David as he's penning these, these psalms that we have a tendency to embrace anger and dish out wrath. That's us. That's people in a nutshell. We're really good at it. Even the most introverted of us. We're really good at just embracing anger and dishing out this wrath. 
whether it's publicly or in our own hearts, either way. But the reality is, is don't let anger control you because it leads to evil. So remember what I shared earlier, that when we allow things to control us emotionally, it affects our actions. And David is saying, don't be angry with what you're seeing because that only leads to evil. Okay, so we know from the book of James, the first chapter, the 20th verse states that the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Okay, so Ephesians 4, 25 through 26 states, therefore, having put away, put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. All right, track with me here. It's okay to be angry concerning sin, but it's not okay to allow that anger to control you and give way to sinful actions. That itself would be a contradiction. It is okay to be upset with the things that we see, the things that we witness concerning sin. However, when we allow that to control us, it will only lead to evil. When our emotions are so pulled away by what we're seeing, and we follow that and we focus after that or on that so intensely that it begins to enrage us. It is going to affect how we live our life. And literally in Colossians 3, we see Paul say, fix your eyes, focus up, right? Fix your eyes on Jesus who is above, not on worldly things. This is all about having a focus on Christ, recognizing who we are in him. Because if we let the sun go down on our anger, we're now going to give opportunity to the devil. That the more we stew on this, the more we allow our anger to brew and build in us, the more opportunity we're giving to our adversary. Right? It's amazing to me how the scripture just does this, right? Like when we start going through verses and you can go through this whole process, you start to see a really cool picture. But in verse 8, God, through David, tells us, refrain from anger, forsake wrath, because anger only leads to evil. But rather, we're to be still and wait patiently for him. And when we share the truth, share the truth in love. Here is the deal. Paul, Paul was very good at articulating this, but he says, uh, essentially, that the truth is offensive, so don't be an offense in how you share it. Right? Like, I'm going to break some things down here for y'all and track with me. But the truth is offensive. Don't be an offense. See, David wants his readers to understand that God takes care of his people both in the here and now and from an eternal perspective. That he's in control, he's trustworthy, and he tends to his sheep, and he is just. But what I want us to see here is that when it comes to sharing the gospel... When it comes to sharing the, the good news of Jesus, what precedes it? The bad news. The bad news precedes the good news. Let me simplify that. You're a sinner. You can't do this on your own. You're in desperate need of saving. That without a savior, you're doomed for all eternity. That's all like crazy, right? Like you're going to walk up to somebody and say, hey, you're evil. You're a sinner. You're wicked. But, but, so was I, right? Until I met Christ Jesus, let me tell you about him, right? I'm being very, very simplified in my approach. But the gospel itself is offensive because it immediately starts with you need a savior. You are not self-sufficient. You cannot save yourself. You are a sinner in desperate need. People don't receive that well, do they? I didn't at first. I got angry. I told that person to stop talking to me about his God stuff. I wanted nothing to do with it. I lost that fight, clearly. Praise God. But you see what I'm saying, though? But if I come at you again like that corridor, and I'm just screaming at you, telling you how wrong you are, and how you're an idiot, and you don't have this figured out, how can you not see this atrocities, and blah, 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 blah. All of a sudden, I'm being in offense. 
and I'm taking a message that is already by its very nature offensive because the truth has a way of dividing. The truth has a way of cutting to the quick, as the scripture states. The truth has a way of coming off as offensive until one receives it and then they realize, oh, I was the offense. But if we are sitting there and screaming at people, treating them poorly, allowing our anger to consume us, we are now offensive, and it's not winsome. It's not helpful. Now, you might have a friend who's pretty thick-headed, maybe a bit of a knucklehead, and you might have to have some harder conversations. That's okay, and I can say that because I was that knucklehead, hard-headed, had to have some hard conversations. I had to have some friends get really real with me, right? But I never once would think that they were offensive in the sense that they themselves were being the problem. Their message was intense to me. But they always handled it in such a way that I knew they cared, even if I didn't agree. That matters. We hear this fact in verse 9. The blessed, you know, that, you, that you're looking at this idea that David is reminding us that the wicked, right, their time is short, and though they seem like they're prospering in the land, it's actually those who wait on the Lord that will inherit the earth. And we've heard Jesus say this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, right, where Jesus talks about what? Meekness. And he says, actually, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Right? Same language. Same language. Those who are walking in submission... Right? Those who, are, those who are walking and those who are meek, they shall inherit the earth. And the biblical definition of meek is follows. Meekness, according to the Bible, is being humble and gentle towards others and willingly being submissive and obedient to the Lord. It's not being selfish and arrogant, loud or obnoxious. Rather, it's having a quiet but confident trust in the Lord and being willing and able to do whatever it is he commands. That's the biblical definition of meekness, which literally sums up the first nine verses of Psalm 37. And the meek shall inherit the earth. Those who wait patiently in the Lord, those who are submitted to him, those who trust him, have a quiet but confident trust in the Lord. Right? It's not about necessarily being a doormat, but it's about being, being, having a quiet confidence not obnoxious, not loud, right? Not selfish, not arrogant. Just sounds a lot like what David's saying in those first nine verses. I don't think it's a small thing. I think it's a pretty big deal. Because again, I think we're in the midst of a very interesting time in history. Where we go from here, I have zero idea. I won't pretend to know. However, like I started with, I could open my Facebook and I could see a bazillion things that are going wrong in the world. And how I respond, how I live, even in those social media worlds, matters greatly. If I had a dollar... For every time I deleted a post or had to change it because I was not necessarily representing Christ because I was allowing my anger to consume me, I'd probably be a pretty rich man. I actually have, believe this or not, I actually have people who I seek counsel on concerning things I'm going to post on social media. Sometimes I go to them and sometimes I'm like, I got this. And then I'm like an hour later taking it off. Because I take it serious. Because I do believe we need to fish where the fish are. And we live in a world where there are a bazillion people using social media. But if I also had a dollar for everyone, I said, hey, why don't we meet and go get coffee? Let's actually have a conversation about this. Let's do it in person. Let's go get lunch. I'd be able to buy their coffee and lunches. And just go and have conversation with people 
Because now I've taken the corridor away, right? Now I've taken the, here's Joe with his Bible verse, and I'm going to read an angry tone into that and assume that he's just being mean. Or say, hey, let's take this out of the public scope and let's have a conversation on the back end through email or a direct message or coffee or lunch. And that's where I, again, have found this to be incredibly fruitful. And if I can't, this is the beauty Beautiful part, a little bit about technology in today's day. If I can't meet with them in person, I could always FaceTime them or use a messenger video chat or get on Zoom, yada, yada, yada. There are ways to connect. Because I believe that the way we live matters because lives are at stake. And I don't want to be the reason somebody runs from Christ. I'd rather be the reason somebody runs to him. And again, if you know me, you know I do not shy away from hard conversations. I work with urban teens that want to have hard conversations. That are doing crazy stuff. And then you're like, dude, come here. What are you thinking? Let's have a conversation. I have no problem with it. But again, the Lord has convicted me intensely on how to have those conversations, to walk in meekness, to not compromise, and yet still love. I have two very important scriptures to share as we close. First Peter 3, 14 through 16 states this. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Again, trust in the Lord and do good. Cultivate faithfulness. Live in such a way that people ask you why you are different and be prepared in that moment to give a defense for the hope that is in you so that they may taste and see that the Lord is good. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord it's holy. Finally, Romans 12, 14 through 20. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Y'all, the admonition for us in this present day is that we would not be overcome by evil, but we would overcome evil with good. Let us represent our Lord and Savior well in this day. And if we should suffer for righteousness sake, praise God but that it would be for righteousness sake. That it would be for the name of Christ, which is above all names, that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. We wear that banner. Let us remember that in our conversations and in our day to day. Let's pray. Father God, you alone are holy. You alone are worthy. Father, we need help. 
Lord, we do live in an interesting time, but it is not a surprise to you. Father, I don't think you're finished. You're still very much at work. Lord, I just ask that you help us. Help us to live as Christ has called us to live so that other people may see and want to glorify you. Help us to remember it's not about us and that we're not going to argue anyone into your kingdom, but that you are the opener of eyes. Father, I just ask that you transform us from the inside out. That we love genuinely. And that we share the truth in love. Willing to have hard conversations, but in such a way that people leave still feeling cared for. Still feeling like they matter. And that we're not just about trying to prove our point or win an argument. Father, help us to prove Christ. We thank you and we praise you. What a blessing it is to be considered sons and daughters of the King. Help us not to forget who we represent. We thank you and we praise you in this day. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.